Hello, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm Rob Burgess, and I head up business development for Sino Biological. And I would like to officially welcome everyone to the next installment in our Lock and Key Immunodetection webinar series. We've got an excellent speaker today on an excellent topic focused on antibody FC effector functions after COVID-19 vaccination. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. One housekeeping issue I want to mention to all of the attendees. If you don't mind, please type your questions into the chat box rather than asking them in real time. And at the end of the seminar, I will verbally run off and read the questions in the chat box to our speaker, and then he will verbally respond to them. And we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the talk. Also, I encourage you to put in the chat box, uh, just introduce yourself and where you're from. We always like to know where everybody is, is keying in from around the world globally. And so with that, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to everyone our speaker for today. It is Dr. Ryan McNamara. And Ryan is a PI and the director of the System Serology Laboratory at the Ragon Institute of Massachusetts General Hospital, MIT, and Harvard. Ryan's lab uses high throughput assays to identify humoral signatures that can be linked to immune responses, pathogen clearance, and clinical outcomes. His lab also employs machine learning techniques, which allow for the prediction of responses to pathogens and how these foundational immune profiles can be shaped to design next generation antibody therapies and vaccine designs. Ryan obtained his undergraduate degree, his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from New Mexico State University, and he obtained his doctorate in microbiology and immunology from UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And the title of Ryan's talk today is the waning and boosting of antibody FC effector functions upon SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. Ryan, it's a pleasure and honor to have you today. And with that, uh, we will turn over screen sharing to you. Okay, so just to confirm, uh, can everybody uh, see my my screen and my little laser pointer here? Yes, Ryan, looks great. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for for the invitation to to sign a biological. Uh, I'm really excited to to present some of our laboratory's findings today. They were just accepted for publication, uh, so the full paper should come out soon. But I I definitely wanted to give you guys a lot more of the details into it, as well as some future directions and kind of the 30,000 foot view of what my laboratory does. So, okay, there we go. So antibody concentrations to an antigen wane with time since antigen exposure. We've all had a crash course in waning immunity during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what's very important to emphasize is that waning antibody responses to an antigen is a totally normal response. And this is not exclusive to COVID-19. Uh, if your antibody titers remain steady since, since time of antigen exposure, your blood would basically be like tree sap. So for example, um, a lot of us on the call here, we were vaccinated against hepatitis B shortly after birth. So we probably don't remember getting the vaccine. However, you have in stored immunity from that vaccination, even though you had it long before you, uh, you remember. So when it comes to more recent uh, vaccination uh, events, such as for COVID-19, uh, a lot of us had the two-dose um, vaccine strategy. In this case, uh, BTMB 16.2b2. This is from the BioNTech. This is the Pfizer vaccine. And what most people had was the two doses. They were spaced out about 21 days. In Moderna's case, they were spaced out 28 days. And then around you know, about a month after your first um, immunization, you had what was called peak, immunogen peak immunogenesis, when your antibody titers are typically the highest. And then over the course of the next five to, to 12 months, 
you have this gradual tapering off of the concentration of your binding antibodies, shown here, as well as your neutralizing antibodies, shown here on the right. I hope you guys can appreciate that while they uh, do look like each other, they do uh, correlate with each other, you do have some antibodies that decay a little bit faster than total antibodies do. So that's in the context of neutralization, but antibodies do a lot more than, than just neutralize. Uh, so I'm gonna go through just the, the two major domains of an antibody here and, and what they do. So up here in this forked off portion of the antibody, this is the fab domain. This is the domain of the antibody that mediates antigen binding and is the target of, of somatic hypermutation in the complementary determining regions, which are you know, usually here in the antigen facing uh, domain of, of the uh, heavy and light chains. And they are diversified to bind to multiple targets within a protein. You also have down here the FC domain. And this is often uh, called the crystallizable fragment of the antibody because it does not undergo somatic hypermutation. It's actually very conserved. Uh, it's also called the constant domain. But as I'll show you guys in this talk, it is really anything but constant. Just because the amino acid uh, sequence of the FC domain doesn't really change, it does not mean that that antibody domain itself is fully constant throughout the duration of antibody production. In fact, this FC domain is really what uh, mediates functional output of the antibody itself. Uh, and these functions are really determined through post-translational modifications of uh, amino acids, particularly asparagines here on the FC domain. And the majority of them are glycosylations, such as galactosylation and uh, sialation. So my laboratory does a, uh, a platform te uh, technique called system serology. And we use this platform to identify how antibody binding can ultimately link with function. So I'm just gonna go over um, how it is that we process our samples here and then give you guys um, an idea on, on how it is that we generated the data that I will be showing you later on in this talk. So the first thing that we do is we take an antibody containing uh, solution, whether it be sera, uh, bronchiolar lavage, saliva, uh, cerebral um, or um, uh, CNS fluid, and we mix that antibody-containing primary solution with an array of target antigens. So we typically do 20, 40, 60 antigens at a time. And we can do this in mass throughput um, with all these antigens all at once. And we can also look at antibody subclass and isotype-specific binding to all of these antigens. We can also look at antibodies that are um, prime for FC receptor affinity. And again, uh, antibodies typically bind to their FC receptors via post-translational modifications here on the FC domain. The majority of these modifications are glycosylation events. This first step here uh, is what I like to call the biochemical and biophysical characterizations arm of system serology. So how exactly do we do this? Well, what we do is we have a, an array of antigens that we bind to individual beads. So we're basically barcoding beads with an individual antigen. So say here in blue, we have a SARS coronavirus 2 spike. So we bind the spike onto this, uh, to this bead. And maybe here in red, we have influenza HA antigen. And then down here in green, maybe we have uh, HCMV glycoprotein. What we do is we mix all these beads together and we incubate these beads with our antibody-containing solution, whether it be sera or, or saliva, bowel, uh, you name it. And we're able to quantify the antibody subclass and binding, or antibody subclass isotype uh, binding to a specific antigen. So say here in blue, we got IgG1. And this individual's IgG1 showed a strong preference for binding SARS coronavirus 2 spike, but it really didn't show uh, a huge preference for binding to HCMB glycoprotein. Say here in orange, you have IgA. Well, IgA seemed to really, this individual's IgA seemed to really preferentially bind to influenza HA, but didn't really seem to want to bind to SARS coronavirus 2 spike. Uh, and then maybe down here, you have IgG4. IgG4 might be preferentially binding to HCMB glycoprotein, but it doesn't really seem to bind to influenza HA or SARS coronavirus 2 spike. And so, how do we distinguish? 
the individual antibody subclasses and isotypes, well, we come in with an antibody that's fluorescently tagged that is directed to the FC domain of this particular antibody subclass or isotype. Antibody subclasses and isotypes are often distinguished by these FC domains based off of uh, length of the FC domain itself, the number of hinges, or other um, amino acid changes, um, IgA and IgM. Uh, they have different FCs. They form different higher order complexes, so we can actually distinguish them via this, this method. For FC receptor binding antibodies, it's a similar principle, but in this case, we actually have purified FC gamma receptors or FC alpha receptors that are uh, fluorescently tagged. And what we're actually asking here is can the antibody bind, can it use this FAB domain to bind to a specific antigen? And is the FC domain of the same antibody prime to bind to a specific FC gamma receptor? And again, we uh, do this via B base flow cytometry assay in a uh, high throughput manner. So that's the first part of system serology. The next part is to identify the humoral functional output. So antibodies do a lot more than neutralize. What are some of the things that they do? Uh, well, they can deposit complement. They can mediate phagocytosis of neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages, and they can also bind to FC receptors on the surface of natural killer cells, resulting in intracellular um, antiviral, antibacterial, anti-helminth events, such as degranulation, cytokine secretion, and inflammatory stigma. So how is it that we do this part? Uh, well, for uh, phagocytosis, such as antibody-dependent uh, cellular phagocytosis of monocytes or antibody-dependent neutrophil phagocytosis, we have antibodies, or I'm sorry, we have antigens uh, coupled to fluorescently uh, labeled beads. And what we're asking here is, is the antibody present in the antibody containing uh, solution, whether it be sera, uh, saliva, bowel, we're asking, can the FAB domain of this antibody bind to an antigen? And can it coordinate with this FC domain to bind to FC gamma receptors that are expressed on the surface of neutrophils, monocytes, or macrophages? And in doing so, can it uh, mediate phagocytosis of this entire complex? And we can measure this by the amount of a bead, of fluorescently labeled beads that are uptaken. And this is a direct measurement of phagocytosis mediated through, through the antibodies themselves. Complement activation is one of my favorite pathways. Complement, uh, a lot of us learned about this pathway in graduate school and medical school, undergrad. Uh, Complement is deposited on, on the surface of a bacteria to puncture holes and cause the bacteria to, to uh, lyse through osmotic pressures. But complement does actually a lot more than that. Complement is deposited on, on other complexes as, as well. And um, phagocytic um, cells like neutrophils have a lot of complement receptor expressed on their surface. So complement can also act as some kind of tag for degradation. So you'll actually see that antibodies um, are frequently coupled with C1Q, which can then mediate enzymatic assembly of C3 on a particular antigen. And this um, C3 deposition will ultimately tag a complex for phagocytosis through uh, complement receptor positive cells, or again, through osmotic pressures. And then the last one that we like to look at is natural killer cell activation. And this one, we uh, coat ELISA plates with an antigen. We then add primary natural killer cells that we get from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, along with our antibody containing solution, again, syrup, bowel, whatever that we're using. And in this case, what we're asking for is can the FAB domain of an antibody bind to an antigen coordinate with this FC domain to bind to FC gamma receptors on the surface of natural killer cells, leading to intracellular uh, signaling cascades, such as degranulation and macrophage inflammatory protein uh, B expressions of pro-inflammatory cytokine, interferon gamma release. Uh, we actually have several outputs of natural killer cell activation. The ultimate goal of system serology is to take these two arms, the antibody binding profile and the humoral functional output and link them um, in order to identify, if we can identify correlates, uh, protection, uh, if we can correlate those, those antibody features with clinical outcomes, ultimately to identify the, these, um, these correlates of protection. So the research question that um, I'll be addressing in this talk is actually two research questions, uh, and they're both related, and we'll both answer them through studies of, of my lab on COVID-19. How are FC effector functions regulated temporally 
since time of antigen exposure. So similar to how you have waning immunity of your neutralizing antibodies, what about FC effector functions? How do they wane with time? Do they wane with time? Uh, do they wane similarly with time? We, we largely don't know. Um, and then the second one is, can wane functions be restored and breadth expanded with vaccine boosting? So if we have a primary immunization series and then come in several months later with a booster, what does that booster do to um, your, your antibody breadth of recognition? But also, what does it do to the functionality of the antibodies that it either recalls or generates? So the cohort over, overview that I'm going to go over here um, in this talk is we had two, um, two, two individual cohorts that are analyzed side by side. Individuals who received two doses of the CoronaVac inactivated vaccine. Um, and the CoronaVac is given a two-dose series, 21 days apart. Um, and here, shown here in the red arrows is when we collect our sera. So we collect it after our first dose, after our second dose. And then we have two waning time periods of months two to three and of months uh, four to five. Uh, this series uh, will later come on with a boost given six months later of an mRNA boost. Um, but uh, for, the, for the most part, for the first um, half of this talk, what I really want you all to focus on or bring y'all's attention to is actually how these two doses, whether it be CoronaVac or mRNA-based, uh, elicit antibodies, elicit their function, and how these antibodies wane with time. So here is the, the raw data of IgG1 binding to either wild-type spike or wild-type spike receptor binding domain. Um, Sera was taken at baseline for our cohorts. So shown here is basically our limit of detection. This is where our naive uh, cohort was. And then dose one and dose two of your BioNTech, Pfizer, M uh, mRNA vaccinations, you see a robust uh, antibody response shown here on the y-axis. Um, we measure antibody concentrations uh, through flow cytometry. So this is MFI and shown here, uh, you can see that we actually have about, about four orders of magnitude of separation to quantify antibody levels uh, within a specific uh, solution. In this case, we're looking at serum. So at two doses, you have peak immunogenicity against both wild type spike and against the receptor binding domain. And then you see this trajectory downwards over the next couple months. This is your waning period. Uh, CoronaVac, shown here in gray, uh, exhibits a similar trend, although the magnitude is, is a little bit different here, it's a little bit lower. But again, you see at peak immunogenicity, you develop a good response to the spike, uh, the folding spike itself, or the receptor binding domain that decreases uh, with time. The stars above the comparisons represent statistical significance. One star is 0.05, less than 0.05, and two stars is less than 0.01. So that is against wild type spike. What about uh, variants of concern? Do we also see this waning towards other variants, including Omicron? So shown here are um, antibody binding levels at peak immunogenicity for both uh, your mRNA vaccines and your CoronaVac vaccines for folding spike or the receptor binding domain. So here is the alpha variant of concern. Here is the beta variant con of concern. And really what you guys can see is that this waning of binding is really a variant of concern independent, uh, at least until you get to, to Omicron, which was always our, our little problem child for, for COVID, right? So Omicron, you had a less, um, your magnitude was much less for your mRNA vaccines. And then this rate of decay was actually accelerated relative to, to your other variants of concern. Uh, for CoronaVac, um, the reactivity towards Omicron was quite minimal. In fact, really the only reactivity that individuals who received CoronaVac was, uh, was to full length spike. Uh, the reactivity towards the receptor binding domain was quite minimal. And then really within two months, it was back down to, to baseline levels. So that's binding antibodies. Well, what about FC binding antibodies? So we're no longer just looking at the fab domain. We're actually looking at the antibodies that are modified on their FC domain that can also bind to an antigen. So if we're going to look at 
antibodies that can bind to FC gamma receptor 2A for wild type spike um, or for re the receptor binding domain. Again, what you can see here is a robust uh, orders of magnitude uh, generation of FC gamma binding antibodies for your mRNA vaccine recipients. You also see that for your uh, coronavac recipients at peak immunogenicity after two doses, they mounted a very strong response to the full-length spike for FC gamma receptor 2A binding antibodies. Uh, you see similar results, although a little bit more heterogeneous for uh, binding exclusively to the receptor binding domain. So what about um, your other FC gamma receptors? So FC gamma receptor 2A, this is a, uh, a vagus cytic uh, primed FC gamma receptors expressed primarily on myeloid lineage cells such as macrophages and, and, uh, and monocytes. FC gamma receptor 2B is canonically known as your inhibitory FC gamma receptor. So this is what is really upregulated when you give a patient um, IVIG. Uh, FC gamma receptor 2B is expressed on, on a host of cells. And really what it, it seems to do is just gobble up a lot of the excess immunoglobulin um, that is out in solution. So again, you can see a very robust um, um, eliciting of FC gamma receptor 2B binding antibodies for full-length spike. Uh, interestingly, you actually see it dive down very fast uh, for not just for full-length spike, but for the receptor binding domain for your mRNA vaccine recipients. For your coronavac recipients, you see it elicited um, modestly after at peak immunogenicity, but then it dives down back to baseline levels really within four months. Uh, and for the receptor binding domain, you actually don't really get any uh, FC gamma receptor 2B responses, at least for individuals who are uh, vaccinated with coronavac. Uh, there's two other FC gamma receptors, FC gamma receptor 3A. It's primarily leveraged through your natural killer cells. So this is the FC gamma receptor expressed on the surface of natural killer cells that funnels into a lot of antiviral effects of of natural killer cells such as um, cytokine release and inflammatory protein uh, secretion. I'll show you guys a little bit later. Again, what you guys can see is that at peak immunogenicity, after two doses of your mRNA vaccine, you get a robust um, expression of FC gamma receptor 3A binding antibodies to wild type spike and to the uh, receptor binding domain of wild type spike. Uh, for your coronavac recipients, the expression of these FC gamma receptor 2A, uh, 3A binding antibodies was lower, and they also waned very rapidly down to baseline levels within about four to five months. In the case for the receptor binding domain, uh, they really basically disappeared uh, two to three months after immunization. And then lastly, FC gamma receptor 3B, this guy is expressed primarily on neutrophils. Again, this is a phagocytic a, a uh, leverage FC gamma receptor and the antibodies linked to this FC gamma receptor to mediate um, opsinophagocytosis of by neutrophils. And as you, you can see here, uh, after two doses of your mRNA vaccine, you get a robust um, FC gamma receptor 3B binding antibody response to wild type spike and to the RBD. However, um, when it comes to your coronavac recipients, only after two doses did you have a detectable response, and that detectable response quickly waned uh, to baseline levels within two months, and that was only for folding spike. So now what about boosting, okay? So you, you basically had your antibody binding and your FCs go down to baseline within two to three months of individuals who received their two-dose CoronaVac. And it's very important because uh, CoronaVac was distributed, hundreds of millions, billions of doses of these things were distributed. Uh, globally. So this is actually very important to, to global health. Um, I know that a lot of people in the United States and in the Americas got the uh, mRNA vaccines or the, um, the CHADOX and the adeno-based vaccines, either um, the, through AstraZeneca or through Johnson & Johnson. But CoronaVac for a while was actually the most deployed vaccine globally. So uh, there was a lot of interest in understanding not only the waning of the immunity given by this coronavac, but could that waned response be restored? And so shown here is our peak immunogenicity titers, a full-length spike and the receptor binding domain of IgG1 and how they wane with time. 
And then over here on the right is the values of these individuals after they're boosted with their mRNA um, vaccine, in this case, the BioNTech BNT162B2. And shown in the colors are the individual variants of concern, whether it be wild type, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron. Shown here in green in omicron, you can see it's lagging all the other variants uh, in terms of initial um, binding activity of the antibodies. Um, but when you come in with your mRNA boost, it jumps up higher than peak immunogenicity titers uh, towards your wild type response. And in fact, every single variant of concern um, was strongly recognized when you came in with an mRNA boost. So that was the fab domain. What about uh, the total antibody response? Okay, so here is all of our anti our IgG subclasses, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4. IgG1 is the most abundant uh, IgG. IgG2 primarily plays a, um, anti, a, um, a role in antibacterial responses, although certainly not exclusive to that, can definitely play antiviral responses. IgG3 is a, high, is a very strong uh, inflammatory immunoglobulin. IgG4 um, usually plays a little bit more of an anti-inflammatory response. IgA, your mucosal barrier, this is your guardian of the mucosa. IgM is the uh, really first line of response of immunoglobulins. And then you got FC gamma receptor 2A, 2B, 3A, and 3B. And shown here is a, um, a heat map of binding to full link spike after your first dose of CoronaVac, your second dose of CoronaVac for all these features, your wanes in months two and three, wanes in months four and five, and then your mRNA boost. And as you can see, when you come in with your mRNA boost, you're basically saturating the signal of binding to, to wild type spike. So what about your other variants of concern and particularly Omicron? Well, you can see the same phenotype really mimic for alpha, beta, uh, gamma, and delta. Individuals who received two doses of CoronaVac mounted a decent response, uh, particularly IgG1 and IgG3. Uh, the FC gamma receptor binding was a little bit low as you get to some of these more distally related variants, particularly for Omicron. However, when you came in with an mRNA boost, uh, responses that were largely absent, that were not even detectable, actually, uh, at peak immunogenicity, were not only strongly detectable, I mean, we were talking orders of magnitude uh, changes in total antibody response. And so what does this actually look like by variant of concern for your FC gamma receptor binding antibodies? Well, shown here is 2A, 2B, 3A, and 3B. For all the variants of concern, here is the uh, color scheme down here at the, the bottom right. Here it is at your waned window. So this is five months after uh, completion of your primary CoronaVac um, um, series, and then post boost with your mRNA. And really what I hope you guys can see here is that all these lines are almost parallel to each other. You have a pan VOC restoration and expansion of antibody binding breadth. And this is across FC gamma receptor um, binding antibodies. And this is a cross variance of concern. So the summary for the first part of my talk is that binding of SARS coronavirus 2 spike, both FAB and FC binding antibodies, wane since time of vaccination. So uh, shown here is uh, figures I took from Levin et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine, which really showed the, uh, the first report of waned immunity or just binding antibodies and neutralization antibodies. What we have shown here is that it's not just the neutralizing antibodies that wane over time, but the FC gamma receptor binding antibodies wane over time. And there is some specificity for rate of waning by FC gamma receptor binding. The waning was platform independent, whether an individual is vaccinated with mRNA or an inactivated virus vaccine, they both waned pretty similar kinetics. However, the magnitudes of the peak responses did differ. However, when you came in with a boost, particularly of individuals who had an inactivated vaccine, the waned response was restored and antibody breadth of a binding was expanded 
And this included uh, the, or the most notable case of this was Omicron BA1, in which individuals who received a coronavac primary vaccine series had minimal, minimally detectable binding to Omicron spike. However, when you come in with an mRNA booster, uh, you basically synchronize your response. There was really no detectable difference in binding of Omicron versus alpha. That's how strongly that mRNA vaccine boost worked to expand uh, antibody binding breath. So getting back to the research question, particularly part one, how are FC effector functions regulated temporally since time of antigen exposure? Well, we know that FC binding antibody or that binding antibodies and FC binding antibodies blame with time, but these can be restored and the breath expanded with an mRNA vaccine boost. So the second half of this talk, I want to focus on the functions themselves. Can these be restored similar to um, FC binding and FAB binding antibodies? And similarly to that, can we actually expand breadth of functionality and not just binding when you come in with a mRNA vaccine boost? So the first thing that we wanted to do is look at how does vaccine boosting actually coordinate your immune response? Uh, so shown here is a, um, a correlation heat map to wild type spike for IgG1 against all these features. And it's uh, a mirror image and you can see pre-boost you have a decent correlation for immunoglobulins, particularly to their FC gamma receptors. Uh, in red is a stronger correlation, and in blue would be um, an ant inversely correlated. So as one goes up, the other goes down. Seeing these occur for IgA and IgM is not terribly surprising. IgA and IgM don't really bind to FC gamma receptors, but you can see them go up um, and along with FC gamma receptor binding antibodies, just kind of showing a coordination of an immune response. And then when we plot the significance of this, so shown here in gray are all the features, um, uh, are all the individual correlation features and going up the y-axis is statistical significance. So um, above this line here, a P equals 0.05, all these features are statistically significant. And what I hope you guys can take away from this is that in gray, which is your peak immunogenicity response after two doses of CoronaVac, you do have um, a decent response, but only some um, features are actually correlated with each other. So this is not exactly a coordinated immune response after peak uh, immunogenicity with this, with this uh, CoronaVac vaccine. However, when you come in with a mRNA booster six months later, you, you really skew this distribution over here to the right where the majority of your features are correlated with the, each other. Uh, you have a nice coordinated immune response that's statistically um, significant over, over, um, over random noise. And this was not exclusive to wild type spike. You see it also for alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And you also are starting to see it a lot even here for Omicron. So you actually had uh, for Omicron, you had quite a few responses that just weren't linked at all. Um, for example, IgG1 was just not linking with FC gamma receptor 2A or FC gamma receptor 2B binding antibodies. They, there just wasn't anything there uh, after two doses of CoronaVac. However, when you come in with an mRNA boost, you'd start to get more IgG1 coordination with FC gamma receptor 2, 2A. But then for 2B, 3A, 3B, all these guys are now strongly coordinated. There's a tight correlation between uh, the rate of increase of binding and FC binding antibodies, showing that the immune system is really starting to catch on to this antigen. So what about the functions themselves, right? So one of the first ones that I introduced was antibody-dependent complement uh, deposition, or ADCD. Um, and as you can see here, for your two doses of your mRNA vaccine, you get a great response to wild type spike and a fairly decent one to Omicron spike for your mRNA vaccine that persists over time. So the antibodies that are present are still capable of depositing a complement on the antigen uh, themselves. You get a decent complement response for two doses of CoronaVac. However, this response quickly wanes uh, with time. You come in with a boost, of mRNA shown here in purple, not only do you restore the waned um, 
uh, phenotype, you actually increase it, at least against wild type spike. For Omicron spike, it was really interesting. You didn't really see any uh, response here in complement deposition, not at peak immunogenicity or um, even after you come in with an mRNA boost. And that is actually because uh, the Omicron spike has a mutation on its internal domain that is kind of the target for complement deposition. So there's really no way of, of, of getting complement latched on to Omicron BA1 spike that we have that we have identified quite yet. Um, but what about your um, phagocytic responses, right? So you got here on the left, antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis by monocytes, and on the right, antibody-dependent neutrophil phagocytosis. Shown here in your mRNA vaccines, you, you elicit a very durable uh, myeloid phagocytic response after two doses. And importantly, this guy doesn't actually wane with time, at least not for wild-type spike. You similarly induce a pretty strong phagocytic response against Omicron spike, but this guy does wane, and it wanes pretty fast. When it comes to Coronavac, Coronavac actually elicited a very strong uh, cellular phagocytosis response. It did wane with time, but you could restore that function with an mRNA boost six months later. What was really interesting was that when you come in with Omicron spike after two doses of Coronavac, you saw a minimal response of cellular phagocytosis. However, when you come in with an mRNA boost of these individuals six months later, you see cellular phagocytosis against Omicron spike that exceeded peak mRNA vaccine titers or peak mRNA vaccine responses. Uh, it certainly uh, exceeded any peak response uh, for Coronavac. So now we're starting to see that that um, waned response was not only restored, but functional capacity of these antibodies, their breadth was increasing at the functional level. It was no longer just binding. And you also see that here for ADNP, for neutrophil media phagocytosis. You see a good response for your mRNA vaccines after two doses that wane with time. With Coronavac, you see a, a lower response that also wanes with time. But when you come in with an mRNA vaccine boost, you see a restoration and, and a real expansion of your neutrophil-driven response. Uh, and then for Omicron spike, you had a minimal neutrophil uh, phagocytosis response of your mRNA vaccines, even at peak immunogenicity. But what's really interesting is for your Coronavac recipients, you had no response at all, <laughs> none, none at all. And then you come in six months later with an mRNA boost, you suddenly have a very, you know, pretty good response that was not even observed in peak immunogenicity of, of your mRNA vaccine recipients. And the last one that I'll show you here is natural killer cell. Again, driving home the message that mRNA vaccine boosting was restoring and expanding functional breadth. So shown here on, on the left for wild type spike at two doses of your mRNA in blue, you get a good response to wild type spike that wanes with time. Uh, for Coronavac, you get a very heterogeneous response based off of, of your of your uh, individual population that also wanes with time. This is a MIP1B expression. This is a macrophage inflammatory protein 1B expression. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine that is released by natural killer cells to really bring in the, the uh, macrophage cavalry. Interestingly, when you look over here to Omicron spike for MIP1B expression, we could not find any detectable response in our mRNA vaccinated individuals or our coronavac vaccinated individuals. The only group that we actually saw any response to for Omicron spike for MIP1B expression was in our mRNA boosted individuals. Um, again, this was, this was pretty surprising to us how strongly this mRNA boost was um, expanding functional breadth. So this is just one readout of natural killer cell activation. Another readout is CD107A expression. This is a marker for degranulation. As you can see here, after two doses of uh, your mRNA vaccine, you had a pretty robust uh, degranulation response. However, with your Coronavac, you didn't really have any for wild type spike. It was only when you came in with a booster that you were able to elicit a response. And again, with Omicron spike, we had no natural killer function for mRNA vaccinated individuals or Coronavac individuals. It was only when the individuals who were vaccinated with Coronavac 
had an mRNA vaccine boost that we could see any response at all to, to Omicron spike. So the mRNA vaccine boosting can yield FC effector functions that were beneath the limit of detection or entirely absent after completion of a primary um, vaccine series. So the summary of, of this second part here is that immune correlates were increased by mRNA vaccine boost of our coronavac recipients, and this was independent of the variant. So this synchronizing of your immune response was seen for both wild type spike and for Omicron BA1 spike. The waned FC effector functions were restored and expanded by mRNA uh, vaccine boosting. Um, ADNP was a great way of, of looking at this where you basically had no response in your coronavac recipients. It was only when you come in with an mRNA vaccine booster that you had any response at all. And not only did they have a pretty good response, they were actually higher than our two doses of your mRNA vaccine recipients. And then functional expansion was evident through gain of natural killer cell media responses that were absent even at peak primary uh, series responses. So natural killer cell responses to Omicron were only detectable um, after mRNA vaccine boosting for Omicron spike. You could see some responses to wild type spike in both your mRNA and your coronavac vaccines, and then you come in with a boost. You really um, uh, recall that response, maybe uh, expanded a little bit. But here with Omicron, uh, it's not so much a recall response as it really is an expansion of breadth. And in data that I don't uh, really have time to show, we do not believe that this is a de novo antibody synthesis because our IgMs were, were still low. Um, so it really wasn't a new affinity maturation process. Uh, we actually think that during this waning period, you have affinity maturation of your B cells regardless of your vaccine platform. And then when you come in with an mRNA vaccine boost, you are able to selectively bring out an antibody, a B cell producing pool that can bind to a bevy of SARS coronavirus to um, antigenic regions. So in conclusion, similar to binding antibodies, FC binding antibodies wane with time since antigen exposure. FC effector media functions wane with different kinetics and are highly sensitive to antigenic distance, for example, from wild type to Omicron. Uh, but boosting of individuals who completed their primary series can provide functions that were absent or beneath the limit of detection through our assays uh, for these antigenically distant uh, immunogens, again, comparing wild type spike and Omicron BA1. And, um, and with that, I hopefully, you know, finishing up here on time, I want to thank uh, my lab, pretty, pretty big lab, there's 40 people <laughs> in, in my lab, um, very diverse interests from SARS coronavirus 2 to malaria, to HIV, to tuberculosis, and we use system serology to really look at all of those, um, all those pathogens, as well as branching out perhaps into some more oncology and, and genetic uh, humoral response, genetically linked humoral responses. I also want to thank our collaborators at Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center and the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research, particularly uh, Dan Baruch and Michael Seaman. Uh, Emory University, this is a collaborator. Um, this, is, this entire project was a collaboration between our lab and the laboratory of um, uh, Professor Rafael Medina. Uh, I also want to thank folks at MGH and the University of Texas at Austin. And also I want to thank the, uh, the kind people at Sina Biological for, for hosting me, as well as responding to some of my um, pretty, you know, absurd requests sometimes when it comes to, uh, to antigen production. Um, you all are, have always been wonderful and, and helpful to me. And with that, I will, I will wrap up. And thank you for, for, uh, for coming. Thank you, Dr. McNamara. It's fascinating work you've done. We really appreciate it. Lots of data there, especially for those of us who are not immunologists or virologists. You made it very easy to understand, so we really appreciate that. And I want to encourage folks to please ask your questions in the chat box. We've got a few minutes left, and I'd like to get to all of them. And it looks to me like the questions are coming in as I speak, so I'll, I'll jump right into it. Let's see what the first question is here. This is a question. The question is, how 
How does the waning profile of the mRNA boost compare to the two doses of the coronavac? Uh, can you say it one more time? How does the waning profile of the mRNA boost compare to two doses of coronavac instead? So that's a great question. And looking at that boosted group and how they wane with time is something that we're, we're doing right now. And it's not just that first boost, right? A lot of us have received multiple boosts. A lot of us just received a bivalent boost. So is the waning kinetics changed based off the number of boosts that you have? And the answer is yes. So the more boosts or the more um, um, exposures to an antigen you have, the slower your rate of decay is for your neutralizing antibodies and your non-neutralizing antibodies. And I think the best way of, of demonstrating this would actually be influenza. Okay, so a lot of us get an influenza vaccine every year. And not only that, but we are exposed to influenza virus. We may just not exhibit symptoms. The majority of influenza infections are asymptomatic. So you're look, the average person might be exposed to influenza antigens three, four times a year, one by vaccination and another couple by exposure in their community settings. What we find is that even when you come in with your annual flu vaccine, um, you're not really increasing antibody titers, neutralization titers, functional uh, units that much uh, because they're already kind of built in. And they're, the more exposures of antigens you get, the more your immune response kind of just settles on a baseline level of neutralization and, and non-neutralization. Great, appreciate that answer. Let me ask something related to, this is just a question for me, and this is very basic. You may have already answered it in your talk, but why is it that the mRNA-based boost is just so much better than the coronavirus or the heat inactivated version of the virus? I mean, what? I know you touched on the responses and stuff, but what's the molecular mechanism that it just makes that boost so much superior to the heat inactivated or the inactivated viral version? So we actually think it's the breadth of immunogens that are presented by one platform or another. So in a heat inactivated um, vaccine like, like CoronaVac, you're actually showing your immune response all sorts of antigens of the virus particle itself not just spike, you're also showing it a uh, nucleocapsid as well, right? And you're showing it some other viral proteins that might be incorporated into the virion. And so that in a way kind of dilutes your response. Uh, with your mRNA vaccines, they're only producing spike. Uh, so that's the only immunogen produced. And also it's, an MR, it's, it's basically a transduction delivery platform. So you're having a continuous production of, of spike. With CoronaVac, you shoot it in and, and that's really it, right? You're not, it, you're not producing this for a number of days. What you're inoculated with with CoronaVac, that's it. With your mRNA vaccines, you continuously make spike for, for a couple of days. It seems that after about uh, five to seven days, your, your immune response is now clearing all of the spike made from the mRNA delivery. But during that time period, you are producing more and more spikes. So I think it's a combination of dilution of the immunogens from, from CoronaVac, as well as the ability for the mRNA vaccines to produce antigen um, for a couple of days after immunization. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. So sustained expression of spike, and then a focus of your immune system only on spike and not on other antigens. Right. Let's get to some participants' questions here. This is from Veronica Athe. She says, uh, boosting was with monovalent mRNA vaccines. That's a question. It's a yes or no question. Was boosting with monovalent mRNA vaccines? Yes. Okay, great. And uh, she attended a little late. She's asking, do you have data on how long that boosted response lasts? Maybe you already presented that. That boost, it depends on the antigen. So waning immunity is tied to antigenic distance of the vaccine immunogen itself. So 
the waned responses to, or I'll, I'll say a sentence. When you come in with that boost, you produce a much longer lived response to wild type spike uh, than you would have after primary immunization series. That durability is different for Omicron BA1, for Omicron BA5, for Delta spike. Each one of those variants, each one of those immunogens has their own unique decay and waning profile. And trying to unravel that is, is something that we're doing right now. It's a great question. I think it's a worthwhile question. I, I certainly think it's worthwhile because we're submitting a paper on it. <laughs> but I, I love the question. But I think it's um, the more we delve into it, the more complicated it, it is because waning kinetics differ based off of the, uh, the immunogen itself. And it also differs based off the number of exposures that you've had. So you got a lot of factors at play that that um, that influence waning kinetics after boost. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. On Friday is asking, given your explanation on what happens upon mRNA boost, would you think the same happens upon infection? And would that be in time to and still a certain level of protection. So I guess there's a comparison here between natural infection and then the mRNA boost. So a little bit yes, a little bit no. Um, when it comes to things like hybrid immunity, which is you know defined as individuals who were vaccinated and also were infected, um, a lot of these individuals had, had like breakthrough infections, and we just um, uh, published a paper specifically looking on that. The immune profiles are durable for individuals who are boosted and individuals who had breakthrough infections, but they kind of fork off a little bit, actually, mm -hmm. as far as what exactly they're targeting, what their functional uh, consequences are, their overall humoral architecture. Um, now, how durable is one versus the other? It's, it's really, it's a little bit difficult to say because I think durability is kind of a question of what exactly you're measuring here. Uh, if you're measuring neutralizing antibody titers, it seems that the uh, like an mRNA boost gives you a longer durable response. If you're looking at breadth of a binding, it, it would seem that infection with Omicron lineages uh, virus breakthroughs kind of increased the uh, the polyclonal pool of antibodies that can latch on to like XBB 1.5 or or you know some other you know, BF seven BA five some of the more diverged Omicron um, uh, lineages functionality it seems that when you have hybrid immunity you have a little bit more natural killer cell responses uh, when you have a boost they seem to be um, going a little bit more towards uh, myeloid lineage responses so they each have. Um, hybrid immunity versus an additional booster, they each add on to your immune profiles. They add on separate ways. Um, so it's kind of hard to say, uh, yeah, how is one better than the other? How does one wane versus, versus the other? Because they do seem to actually um, result in different humoral profiles once um, not all the dust settles. Great. All right. Thank you for that. We have a, another really good question. It looks like a hard one. It's from Marcarius Catero Munda, who's joined us previously in other webinars. Marcarius's question is if an individual gets an overt COVID infection before getting two doses, what would be the difference between a cytokine profile from that of an individual who never received any dose of the vaccine? So the cytokine, so this is actually ties into the previous question. Um, a lot of the cytokine profiles are generated based off of natural killer cell responses and, and to, a, to a degree also macrophage responses. So if an individual is infected and then they got their, their vaccine, okay, their cytokine responses is actually quite different versus individuals who just got their vaccine because their natural killer cells are already primed. 
to basically have what's called a recall or an animistic response. Um, that response for individuals who weren't infected really only peaks after two doses of a vaccine. And even then, it's it can be quite low. Um, as you guys saw, like our natural killer cell responses were, were okay against wild type spike, but were pretty much absent for Omicron spike, whether you had your mRNA vaccine or whether you had your inactivated vaccine. Now, if an individual was infected and then had um, a, a vaccine, their natural killer cell responses are actually quite, quite substantial. Similarly, if a person was vaccinated and then was infected, uh, again, the, the natural killer cell responses are, are quite strong uh, mm -hmm. for that. And that can actually be read through um, your, your cytokine profile. Mm -hmm. Great. Rhonda Green uh, from Texas has a great question here. And I think this really applies because most people worldwide have gotten the mRNA-based vaccine rather than the inactivated version of the virus. And Rhonda asks, have you looked at the reverse, i.e. boosting the mRNA vaccine with the coronavac or Omicron specifically? You know, we, we did. <laughs> we did. Um, and the responses were 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 not really strong. Uh, this was actually a separate study that we were doing was kind of looking at individuals who had a follow-up coronavac, uh, comparing them with people who had a, an actual breakthrough infection. So like that hybrid immunity versus a coronavac booster. So you can kind of think of coronavac as it, it isn't an activated virus. So all the antigens that are being presented are similar to that of, of a natural infection, right? So you would think, okay, if, if you had your your immunization platform and you come in either with a coronavac or, or an actual infection challenge, maybe your immune profiles are, are shaped similarly. They're, they're actually not. Uh, when you come in with a, a live virus challenge, uh, your immune system is actually much more robust and it's a little bit more fine or it's a little bit more tuned to, um, to natural killer cell responses. When you come in with, with coronavac, really the only thing that we saw was kind of a recall response, um, just finding what the peak immunogenicity titers were and bringing them back up to that after your waned window, not really expanding um, humoral breadth, at least not in the cohort that, that we looked at for that one. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Well, we're basically out of time now. So any other questions we can get to on the side and have um, emailed responses back if Dr. McNamara is okay with that. First, let me thank all the attendees. We had a wonderful turnout today. Just very briefly, I want to mention we had folks from Uganda and Canada and Ghana, Germany, Texas, Brazil, Trinidad, Romania, Saudi Arabia, and really across the United States. So thank you all for attending. I know that the time zone difference can be a bit inconvenient for you, but we appreciate it. Dr. McNamara, I want to thank you specifically for a fantastic talk and for agreeing to be our lecturer on uh, BioTalk Tuesdays. We appreciate this fascinating work you've done. I want to congratulate you and your team there at the Ragon Institute. It's just wonderful work you've done, um, and we look forward to more exciting data and studies in the future from you. Um, and then finally with that, I wanna thank my colleague and good friend, Max Bleckham at Sina for organizing and executing this event. Once again, Max did a great job. And so with that, I believe we'll sign off and I thank everybody once again, and I bid you a good afternoon or good evening. Thank you all. Bye-bye.